please, Father, give us that vision. Give us that vision of how tiny we are and how majestic and how mighty you are. And then help us to recognize that in combining human weakness with infinite power, we can be a force in this world that nothing can stop. Father, make us those forces in this world by your Spirit through your power to declare and disclose to all the world the sins of Babylon and the man of sin. Help us to be mouthpieces for the King of Heaven. Help us to magnify and exalt your great and mighty and awesomeness and your power. Please bless us to do that, Father, and to trust and to cling to you, knowing that you will knock down one giant after another in the days ahead. Thank you that you will give us the opportunities to see that. And Father, if you ask any of us to go to sleep early, help us to be faithful. Help us to be faithful, no matter what the cost, so that we can see Jesus in peace. Bless us as we study this afternoon together. Give us eyesight that we can see. We're so blinded by the things of this world and the propaganda. Help us to see clear. Help us to see clear. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let's open up our Bibles this afternoon to Revelation chapter 18. Revelation chapter 18. We're going to be looking at the money people, or I like to say the ones who live by the golden rule. The ones with the gold rule. Revelation chapter 18 and verse 3. It says, For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. Now right there in that verse we see three different powers, three different entities that are controlled by Babylon the Great, of course, the papacy. Number one, it says the nations of earth are all drunk on the wine of the wrath of her fornication. It says the kings of the earth, the leaders of this earth, are controlled by Rome. Now, folk, apply. We've got to apply what this is saying. The kings of the earth, we're talking about George Bush, we're talking about Hussein, we're talking about Tony Blair, we're talking about the leaders of Germany and France. They're all in this together. We're being lied to when we're told that they're divided up. That's not true. They're together. They have their certain roles in the theatrical performance they're playing. The end of verse 3 says, The merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. So the merchants of the earth, the wealthy of the earth, the business people of the earth that control big business, the super rich, wax rich through their connection with Rome and the Jesuit order. Now, who are the rich today? Let's apply it. When we talk about the super rich, we're talking about the Rockefeller family. They are controlled and in cahoots with the Jesuits and the Catholic Church. The Rothschilds of Europe, um, the Gates, of Washington and Microsoft, controlled by Rome. Bill Gates' wife is a devout Roman Catholic. You can be sure, you can be sure that Bill Gates understands who is behind and who controls his bank account. You can be sure he knows that. 
the Waltons. Sam Walton of Walmart fame. Three or four of his children are in the top ten of the Fortune 500 in America. Three or four of his children, three or four in the top ten. Do they have money? Where did they get their money? The Walton family, Sam Walton, I've told you this before, had a little tiny five and dime store in Bentonville, Arkansas, northwest corner of Arkansas. For decades, he had one little five and dime store. And then in the 1980s, when Bill Clinton became the governor of Arkansas and began to float drug money through Arkansas, overnight, Sam Walton became a brilliant businessman. And his little five and dime store became a conglomerate all over the world. Now, what happened to Sam Walton? How was it that he became so brilliant in business as when Bill Clinton came into office and all that drug money started going through Arkansas. Folk, Sam Walton was bought out. Walmarts are controlled and run and the wealth of Walmart comes through the Jesuit order. There is so much information, so much evidence out there of the drug money that was brought. Dr uh, weapons were sold to the Contras in Nicaragua. C-130s carrying all this ammo was taken to Nicaragua. And then the Nicaraguans would put on to these C-130s all of these drugs. They were brought into Arkansas. They were sold in Arkansas and throughout America. And Bill Clinton and his cronies in Arkansas had so much money, they didn't know what to do with it all. And so what did they do? They bought out Sam Walton. They bought out L.B. Hunt and his trucking company. They bought out Tyson with the chicken food. You know the chicken industry? They bought those men out. And now those men are the greatest business people in America. Well, if I had that kind of money, I'd be pretty good in business too. Revelation 18, verse 3 says, The merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. Now, notice verse 15 of Revelation 18. Verse 15 of Revelation chapter 18. It says, The merchants of these things... Now, I want you to notice the next phrase. It says, which were made rich by her. Her is Babylon the Great. Babylon the Great is the papacy. Revelation 18 verse 15 says that the merchants of the earth were made rich by the Vatican. That's who made them rich. So the super rich of the earth today are controlled by the Catholic Church and the Jesuit order. It surprised me in one document I read maybe a few years ago now that somebody, when a Walmart truck was unloading their goods from the truck, in the way back of the truck they noticed certain things. They noticed some um, signs that had been made and they say uh, something like keep out martial law in effect don't go past this and there were many many signs like this in Walmart in a Walmart truck and I thought a Walmart truck they're supposed to be selling goods to people in America how did those signs get in the back of their truck they must have been snuck on but Revelation 18 verse 15 says that the merchants of the earth are in cahoots with 
the New World Order, and the Catholic Church. And so those Walmart vehicles that we see going down the interstates, they may not be carrying Walmart goods. Now obviously some of them are. But Revelation 18 and verse 15 makes it very, very clear that the merchants of the earth are controlled by Rome, by the Jesuit order. It is for that reason that Revelation chapter 13 can make this statement. Revelation 13 verses 16 and 17. Revelation 13 verses 16 and 17 talking about America, the second beast of Revelation 13, 16, it says, and he, this is the second beast, the lamb-like beast, causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark of the name of the beast or the number of his name. So, folk, there will come a point in earth's history because of Rome's control over the financial realm of this world, over the banking systems of this earth, they will have such dominance that they will be able to dictate who buys and what you buy and when you buy or even if you buy. And they can only do that they can only have what Revelation 13, 16, and 17 is saying if they control business and finance throughout the world. Revelation 13, 16, and 17 makes it very, very clear that those who eat will honor the beast. Those who eat will have the mark. The money people and the beast work together. Now obviously we have the precious promise in Isaiah chapter 33, verse 16 and 17. It says that he shall dwell on high, his place of defense shall be the munitions of the rocks, bread shall be given to him, and his waters shall be sure. Amen. So no matter what happens in this world, God's people are going to be taken care of. And I'll tell you something, folk. The devil so desperately wants God's people to believe that we don't want to say anything about the beast because we want to make sure that we don't bring on persecution. Because we don't want to not have anything to eat or to drink. But folk, in actuality... As you look at the overall picture, those who will not eat and those who will not drink are those who are with the beast and his image. Because we are going to be seeing missiles that are going to be destroying factories and wiping out food supplies around this world. Do you realize that? That's what's going to happen. And only those who are walking lowly before God, He will feed them. How He will do it? Lift up your heads. He'll rain manna down from the sky. That's what He'll do. But He's promised He'll feed us. He's promised He'll take care of us. So our part is, is to be low before Him. That's our part. And everything else will be taken care of. Praise God. Praise God today. Now, let me read a few statements to you. This is from a book called Rulers of Evil by F. Tupper Saucy. I've read to you out of it before. F. Tupper Saucy declares exactly what Revelation 13 and 18 declare that the papacy controls the money people of this world. Let me read it to you. It's on pages 160 and 161. 
And he gets this from the Jewish Encyclopedia. He says, Aware that the Rothschilds are an important Jewish family. I looked them up in Encyclopedia Judaica and discovered that the Rothschilds bear the title Guardians of the Vatican Treasury. The appointment of Rothschild gave the black papacy absolute financial privacy and secrecy. Who would ever search a family of Orthodox Jews for the key to the wealth of the Roman Catholic Church? So the Rothschilds are used by the papacy and they hide behind them. Now how much power, how much wealth does the Rothschild family have? From the book Rothschild Money Trust by George Armstrong, he says this, We don't know the extent of their fortune in 1812. Nor do we know the present magnitude of it. And he wrote this book in 1940. But he said this, Apparently, the Rothschild wealth represents about one half of the wealth of this world. Now you know what? For a guy like me, I can't fathom. And I bet there isn't anybody in this room that can fathom that either. They control half of the wealth of this world. Now, we will go on and find out later that the Rothschild family was the family that the Jesuit order used to finance Standard Oil, and the Rockefeller Empire, the Carnegie Empire of Bethlehem Steel, the uh, Harriman Railroad Empire that sent railroads all across this country, the Rothschilds and the Jesuit order financed those. So when you hear Rockefeller or you pull up to a standard gas station, that's Rockefeller. And through the Rockefellers and the Rothschilds and some of these other super rich people, half of the world's wealth, they control nearly 90% of the world's wealth. These people have mega, mega amounts of money. Now your question is probably, well, how did they do that? How do you get to be that wealthy? Well, I'll show you. It's in this book. In fact, Des Griffin reads a statement uh, from a Rothschild biographer. And their, their slogan, the Rothschild family slogan is, is the family that prays together stays together. Now you say, Bill, you've been downing the Rothschilds. They're a good family. They said the family that prays together stays together. Well, you know what? The way they spell the word praise is not P-R-A-Y-S. They spell it P-R-E-Y-S. Do you get the point? They prey on other people. They devour other people. Now I want to show you how they did it. I want to show you how they did it. This is taken from the book Descent into Slavery by Des Griffin. In 1815, there was a very, very famous battle that was fought. It was called the Battle of Waterloo. And it was between Napoleon Bonaparte and the French and General Wellington and the British. And whoever won that battle between Napoleon and Wellington, it would determine who would control Europe. Okay? Very important battle. They met at Waterloo, 1815. This was in June. 
Now I want to pick up the story from Des Griffin. He says this, There were vast fortunes to be made and lost on the outcome of the Battle of Waterloo. The stock exchange in London was at fever pitch as traders awaited news of the outcome of this battle of the giants. If Britain lost, English money would plummet to unprecedented depths. The stock market business would go whoop and nothing would be worth anything. Okay? But if Britain won, the value of British currency and British stock would leap to dizzying heights. Okay? You see what's happening? If Britain loses, the stock market goes down and, no, and the money's worth nothing. If Britain wins, then everybody wants to buy British because British controls now. You see? And so the value of the British pound goes up. Well, listen to what happened. As the two huge armies closed in for their battle to the death at Waterloo, Nathan Rothschild had his agents working feverishly on both sides of the line to gather the most accurate information as the battle proceeded. Additional Rothschild agents were on hand to carry the intelligence bulletins to a Rothschild command post strategically located nearby. Late on the afternoon of June 19, 1815, a Rothschild representative jumped on board a specially chartered boat and headed out into the English Channel in a hurried dash for the English coast. In his possession was a top secret report from Rothschild's Secret Service agents on the progress of the crucial battle. This intelligence data would prove indispensable to Nathan Rothschild in making some vital decisions at the London Stock Exchange. The special agent was to meet at Folkestone the following morning at dawn. He was met at Folkestone the following morning at dawn by Nathan Rothschild himself. After quickly scanning the report, Rothschild was on his way again speeding towards the London Stock Exchange. Now what's he going to do? You watch what he does, Charlie. You, you'll be shocked. Arriving at the London Stock Exchange amid frantic speculation. Now why is there speculation? Nobody else knows who's won the battle at Waterloo. But Rothschild had agents right there at the battle. And they came across the English Channel, told him who won the battle at Waterloo. So Rothschild's the only one that knows. Now watch. Nathan took up his usual position beside the famous Rothschild pillar in the London Stock Exchange. Without a sign of emotion without the slightest change of facial expression. The stony-faced chief of the House of Rothschild gave a predetermined signal to his agents who were stationed nearby. Rothschild agents immediately began to dump their stocks on the market. Okay? As hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of stocks poured onto the market, their value started to, guess what? It started to slide. Then they began to plummet. Nathan continued to lean against his pillar, emotionless, expressionless. He continued to sell and sell and sell. Stocks kept on falling. Word began to sweep through the stock exchange. Rothschild knows. Rothschild knows. Wellington has lost at Waterloo. Did Wellington lose at Waterloo? No. He won. The selling on the London Stock Exchange turned into a panic. 
as people rush to unload their worthless stocks in the hopes of retaining at least a little of their wealth. After several hours of feverish trading, the London stock market was in ruins. It was selling for about five cents on the dollar. Nathan Rothschild, emotionless and expressionless as ever, still leaned against his pillar. He continued to give subtle signs, but these signals were different. They were so subtly different that only the highly trained Rothschild agents could detect the change. On the cue from their boss, dozens of Rothschild agents made their way to the order desks around the exchange and bought every stock in sight for almost nothing. In one day on the London Stock Exchange, Nathan Rothschild took control of the economy of England. You realize that? One day. Agents at Waterloo, they come across the English Channel, they tell Nathan Rothschild, Wellington has won. Nathan Rothschild knows that as soon as the people in the stock market know that, everything's going to jump out of sight. The stocks are going to go at high as, high as the sky. But only he knows it. He comes into the stock exchange. He tells his agents in the stock exchange, sell the stocks, sell the stocks. And then all the other stock people there, all the other traders, they say, oh, we've got to get rid of our stocks so we can get at least a little bit of our money back. And every stock goes down to be almost worthless. And then Nathan Rothschild says, now. And his agents go around and buy up every stock for almost nothing. And then, once the news comes into England, Wellington has won the Battle of Waterloo. Guess what happened to the stocks? They went right through the roof. And guess who became an incredibly wealthy man. That's how Nathan Rothschild and the Jesuit order took over the economy of England. Now, there's something else that's very interesting that I want to read to you that I think will help you to understand what is really happening with Tony Blair today. See, when we look in the newspaper today, we think, oh, Tony Blair, he's the ruler of England, don't we? You know what? That's a joke. That's a joke. Tony Blair does not rule England. You know who rules England? The Rothschild family. Because they own the money of England. And if they want Tony Blair in office, they have enough money to control the press and to control the people so that Tony Blair is put in. And if they, if they don't want Tony Blair in, you know what happens? Tony Blair disappears. He disappears. Let me read to you. Again, from the book, Descent into Slavery by Des Griffin. Incredible. See if I can find it. Okay, here it is. Page 41 and on. It says, When people think of England, they think of Great Britain, the Queen, the Crown, the Crown Colonies, London, the City of London, the British Empire, and so on. But he says this, When we speak of the city, we're not in fact referring to we are, in fact, referring to a privately owned corporation or sovereign state that occupies 677 acres and it's located right in the heart of the greater London area. So within the city of London, there is a very small area called the city. Now, who runs the city? It says this, 
The city is run by the crown. The crown is a committee of 12 to 14 men who rule the independent sovereign state known as the city. The city is not a part of England. It's not subject to the sovereign of England. It's not under the rule of the British Parliament. It's a separate independent state. The city is the wealthiest square mile on earth. It is ruled over by a Lord Mayor. Here are grouped together Britain's great financial and commercial institutions, wealthy banks dominated by the privately owned Rothschild-controlled Bank of England, Lloyd's of London, the London Stock Exchange, and the offices of the most leading international trade concerns. Now listen to what happens when Tony Blair goes to the city. Or when Margaret Thatcher or John Major. When they went to the city, this is what happened. When the Queen of England, when Queen Elizabeth goes to the city, she is met by the Lord Mayor at the gate of the city. She bows and asks permission to enter his private sovereign state. Now who's controlling who? The Queen of England bows to the Lord Mayor of the financial city of Greater London. Who's controlling who? The Rothschilds and the Jesuit order control England. They control England, English finance. They control the parliament and England total. Going on, it says... He grants permission to enter by handing her the sword of state. During such state visits, the Lord Mayor in his robes and chain and his entourage in medieval costume outshine the royal party who dress up no further than service uniforms. The Lord Mayor leads the queen into his city. These people rule England and the world. And George Bush and the leaders of this nation, there's a city in this country too, folks. And the leaders of this country bow just as the leaders of England do. Now, I want to take a look at one other aspect of this whole thing, and that has to do with the banking in the United States. Today we have a Federal Reserve Bank, or a Federal Reserve System, headed up by Alan Greenspan. And I don't know if anybody has noticed, but whenever Alan Greenspan opens his mouth to speak, everybody stops breathing. Have you noticed that? And the stock market, everybody at the stock market just, they freeze. Now, Alan Greenspan, at the head of the Federal Reserve, we need to understand who was behind the establishment of the Federal Reserve System. The Federal Reserve System is a centralized bank. That's what it is. It's a central bank. It's not American. It's controlled by foreigners, has no control by Americans whatsoever. From this book called The Creature from Jekyll Island by G. Edward Griffin, on page 325, he declares, and let me read it to you, page 325 of this book, he says that the first bank, central bank, that was established in the United States of America was formed by one Robert Morris, a member of Congress, and uh, he established it right around 1781. I want to read something to you that should be very interesting at this point. On page 325 of this book, it says that Robert Morris patterned the Central Bank of North America after 
the bank of guess what country? Which one? England. And who was controlling the bank of England? The Rothschilds and the Jesuit order. Robert Morris, who started the first central bank of North America, was a wealthy Philadelphia merchant who had profited greatly from war contracts during the Revolution. Very, very intelligent man as far as money was concerned. But Robert Morris, because of greed, the first central bank of the United States collapsed. And so then, towards the late 1700s, another gentleman came along, in fact in 1790 to be exact, and this man's name was Alexander Hamilton. And in 1790, Alexander Hamilton, with much opposition from a gentleman by the name of Tom Jefferson, Alexander Hamilton pushed for another central bank in America. Well, it passed as well. And so the second attempt at a central bank in America came into being in 1790. But once again, Thomas Jefferson opposed a central bank. This is what Jefferson said, and it's quoted on page 329 of this book, Creature from Jekyll Island. He said, A private central bank issuing the public currency is a greater menace to the liberties of the people than a standing army. Did you hear that? It is more dangerous, according to Thomas Jefferson, to have a central bank than to have a foreign army on U.S. soil. But you know what? For almost the last hundred years through the Federal Reserve Bank of Alan Greenspan and Company, we've had just that. And it's very interesting, in light of Jefferson's statement, Ever since the creation of that Federal Reserve Bank, look what's happened to the liberties of the United States of America. They've been, they're being shredded. They're being shredded. And there's a reason those two things go together. Who was behind Robert Morris's attempt to have a central bank in 1781? And who was behind Alexander Hamilton's attempts to have it established again in 1790? Let me read it to you. Page 331 of Griffin's book, Creature from Jekyll Island, he says this, The blunt reality is that the Rothschild banking dynasty in Europe was the dominant force both financially and politically in the formation of the bank of the United States. So who was behind Robert Morris? the Rothschilds and the Jesuit order. And who was behind Alexander Hamilton? The Rothschilds and the Jesuit order. They knew if they could control the bank, they could control the people. He goes on, he says, Biographer Derek Wilson says, The official European banker for the U.S. government and a pledged supporter of the Bank of the United States was Nathan Rothschild. The Rothschilds, therefore, were not merely investors. They were the power behind the Bank of the United States. The significance of the Rothschild power in American finance and politics was the subject of extensive comment in a previous section of this book. So folk, as far back as the early 1900s, in fact, in, in the 18th century, right at the very beginnings of this country, the Catholic Church wanted to destroy this nation from its very inception. You say, but Bill, how could they do that? How could they gain such control? Well... Daniel Webster was a famous senator. Daniel Webster and the Senate of the United States was in the pocket. They were in the pocket of the Rothschild family. 
And so if you, as a politician, are in the pocket of somebody else, how are you going to vote? How are you going to vote? If somebody comes along and says, hey, I'll give you three million, but you vote this way. This will put your kids through school. This will buy you a new house. What are you going to do? If you're not a person of principle, you're going to say, where do I sign? And that's what senators and congressmen have been doing since the early 1800s in America. The Third Central Bank was attempted in 1860 and it was passed. And the man who eventually took it over was a man by the name of Nicholas Biddle. And uh, Nicholas Biddle controlled the central bank. He was a Rothschild agent, according to uh, Griffin's book, Creature from Jekyll Island. Nicholas Biddle started or took over the bank. It was started in 1816. It had a 20-year charter. But in 1832, Nicholas Biddle decided that he was going to renew the charter four years ahead of time. But after Congress passed it into law to have it extended for another 20 years, Andrew Jackson vetoed it. And in spite to Andrew Jackson and to get back at Andrew Jackson, what Nicholas Biddle did with his central bank is he began to withdraw funds from the American economy. And he began to make it so that people could not get loans to build houses or to build up businesses. And so Nicholas Biddle, in the early 1830s, created, he created a depression in America. So with a central bank, the Jesuit order, the Rothschilds, have America by the throat by the throat fortunately Andrew Jackson put his life and his presidency on the line continued to fight against Nicholas Biddle and Andrew Jackson finally won out because Andrew Jackson loved the Constitution of the United States as a result of Jackson fighting against Biddle and against the Jesuits and the Rothschilds, guess what happened to Andrew Jackson, 1835? A hired assassin tried to kill him on the steps. As Andrew Jackson was coming down steps there in Washington, D.C., there was a man at the bottom, a man by the name of Richard Lawrence. He had on a long overcoat, and in each pocket he had a revolver. He had a gun. And as Jackson's coming down the steps, Richard Lawrence pulls out one gun to shoot him, and the gun would not fire. It would not go off. So then Richard Lawrence pulled out the other gun to shoot Andrew Jackson, and it didn't go off either. Andrew Jackson's life was miraculously preserved. And um, Richard Lawrence got off by reason of insanity. But it's interesting to note, and... Griffin declares it. He says that Lawrence said that there were wealthy people in Europe that told him to kill Andrew Jackson. And if he got caught, they would be sure that they got him off free. Welcome to America. The Federal Reserve Bank of Nicholas Biddle died out in 1836. That's when the 20 year charter ended. And from 1836 down to 1912, 1913, excuse me, there was no bank, central bank in America. The Rothschilds tried to get a central bank during the Civil War, but Abraham Lincoln stopped it. But finally, in the early 1900s, the Jesuit order of the Catholic Church had enough control through the various powerful business people 
J.P. Morgan, Andrew Carnegie, John D. Rockefeller, Leland Stanford, um, Harriman of the uh, railroad. They controlled all of these wealthy, powerful people who in turn controlled many people in Congress. And as a result, they were able to pass into law in 1913 to have a Federal Reserve Bank in the United States. The main people behind the Federal Reserve Bank that came in in 1913 were Rockefeller, Rothschild, and Morgan agents. They met right up here north in Jekyll Island, Georgia, and they established the Federal Reserve System of the United States of America. Very, very interesting if you look at the events that surrounded the Rothschild Jesuit controlled Federal Reserve Bank that established in 1913. The events that transpired around it, number one, was the sinking of the Titanic. And on board the Titanic were many, many wealthy people who opposed the Federal Reserve Bank. Among those would be um, Benjamin Guggenheim, Isidore Strauss, and John Jacob Astor, three very, very wealthy men, among many, many others, all died on the Titanic, and they did not go along with the Federal Reserve Bank. It's also very interesting in light of the sinking of the Titanic that the Titanic was a part of, according to G. Edward Griffin's book, The Creature from Jekyll Island, the Titanic was built by a company called the White Star Line. And the White Star Line was a shipping company that was owned by a man by the name of J.P. Morgan. And J.P. Morgan, according to this book, Creature from Jekyll Island, page 208, I believe. Let me read it to you. 209. It says this. The Morgans were from England. They were friendly competitors with the Rothschilds and became socially close to them. Did you notice that? The Morgans and the Rothschilds in England were friends. They were buddies. But guess what happened? You remember now the family that P-R-E-Y-S together stays together. Mysteriously, the business of J.P. Morgan began to fall. Isn't that amazing? It says, Morgan's London-based firm was saved from financial ruin in 1857. So J.P. Morgan's budding business begins to go on a tailspin, and just before it crashes, guess who saved it from crashing? The Rothschilds and the Bank of England. And you know what? As a result of the Rothschilds and the Bank of England saving J.P. Morgan from financial ruin, it says, Thereafter, J.P. Morgan appears to have served as a Rothschild financial agent and went to great lengths to appear totally American. So the Morgans were saved from ruin by the Rothschilds and thereafter J.P. Morgan was their agent. And it was J.P. Morgan's agents, Rockefeller agents and Rothschild agents that created our Federal Reserve Bank that we have today. J.P. Morgan, as a Jesuit agent, bought up the White Star Line, this international shipping industry. And in 1909, in the Belfast harbors of Ireland, commissioned for the building of 
the floating palace called the Titanic. And isn't it amazing that the Titanic, on its first voyage, had on it all these wealthy people who opposed the Federal Reserve System and they ended up dying. The unsinkable ship. That's right, Charlie. The unsinkable ship. Well, folk, the unsinkable ship of the Titanic was a Jesuit ship that was created to be the death, the grave, for those who oppose the Federal Reserve Bank. And that's exactly what it was. It's very interesting. And we're going to close on this this afternoon. The man who ran the Titanic, his name was Edward Smith. For 26 years, Edward Smith guided ships across the North Atlantic Ocean. He worked for J.P. Morgan for years as a captain, famous for his abilities as a captain of ships. But on the night the Titanic sunk, somehow Edward Smith had forgotten how to be a good captain. And for some reason, as warning after warning after warning came to Edward Smith to slow the ship down and to turn it away from the gigantic ice field that they were in. For some reason, Edward Smith did not listen. And he was a brilliant sea captain. You know what, folk? The facts are in. Edward Smith, working for Jesuit agent J.P. Morgan, was a tool of the Jesuit order and Edward Smith was told to sink the Titanic and to bring to that watery grave all those rich people who would oppose the Jesuits' establishment of the Federal Reserve Bank. You know, folk, a lot of people say, Bill, you've lost your marbles now. You've gone too far now. Well, folk, let me tell you something. And I want you to think about this. Two presidents have opposed the Federal Reserve Bank. Okay? Andrew Jackson in 1832 and John F. Kennedy in 1963. There was an attempt on Andrew Jackson's life to kill him. John F. Kennedy was killed. Now, how are the Jesuits and the Rothschilds going to treat the wealthy of this world who are going to use their mega millions of dollars to oppose the establishment of a Federal Reserve System. How are they going to deal with them? They're going to kill them. And that's exactly what they did. The giant lurks, the giant looms. But as Nehemiah said in Nehemiah chapter 4, and we'll close with these courageous, these courageous words that minister to my heart time and time and time again. In Nehemiah chapter 4 and verse 14, listen to what Nehemiah had to say. And we will close. Nehemiah chapter 4 and verse 14. He said, And I looked and rose up and said unto the nobles and to the rulers and to the rest of the people, Be not ye afraid of them. Remember the Lord. He is great and terrible. And fight for your brethren, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses. Praise the God of heaven today. He is great. And He is terrible. And all of these people we've been talking about this afternoon, they're going to have their end. Let us pray. Loving Father in heaven, 
Thank you that you have control. You see what's going on. You allow these things to happen so that when you take the field in power, in grandeur, when you say, it's enough, it's now time to do battle, Father, when it happens, we're going to see that it's you and you alone. That praise and glory and honor and thanksgiving will go to you for your great and mighty and terrible power. Oh, Father, help us. Help us to bow low before you so that when that time comes, we're going to be able to say, Lo, this is our God. In Jesus' name, amen.